Good day to everyone. My name is Paige Ganuni, and I'm moderating this panel on the use of focused ultrasound for the treatment of musculoskeletal diseases. We are excited to have a great panel today. Ara Cannonell from Fuss Mobile Incorporated, Erin Kim from Children's National in Washington, D.C., Matthew Buckner from the University of California at San Francisco, and Joanne Tui from Virginia Tech. We will start with messages from each panelist and then move to a discussion of questions on focused ultrasound for musculoskeletal disease. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Real privilege to, to be able to talk a little bit about focused ultrasound treatment of desmoid tumors. I only have a few minutes, so I'm just going to jump right into my slides here. So desmoid tumors, as many of you are aware, are benign but locally aggressive neoplasms that derive from fibroblasts. And they can be sporadic, related to beta catenin mutations, or familial. Far and away, the most common form that we see are sporadic. And often, they're associated with a, a vague history of trauma in the region from years prior. Despite many conventional treatments, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, there tend to be high levels of recurrence. So it's a real opportunity for, for focused ultrasound to offer benefit for these patients. This is the device that I think is used most often to treat patients um, with these tumors in the United States. It's the Insitec Exoblate device. You can see large power cord going to the center of the table, translucent window there supplying the in-table phase to ray transducer. Now, the benefits of focused ultrasound we all know and love, completely non-invasive, no ionizing radiation, can really precisely target the, the treatment, and we can repeat it as necessary. Um, the risks are pretty standard here, the risk of a skin burn, thermal damage to adjacent structures, and pain. Patients typically have a, a couple of days of moderate pain following these treatments. So when we talk about focused ultrasound treatments for desmoid tumors, it's helpful to think first, why, why does surgery not work? as an ideal treatment for these patients. And what we can see here is that if a surgeon took this patient to the operating room, they probably would have no trouble identifying this large mass along the lateral aspect of the gluteal musculature at the level of the hip. But what they have a lot of trouble seeing is this more infiltrative aspect of the mass that's extending towards the, the right greater trochanter there of the femur. And that makes it very difficult to perform a complete and total resection. So here's an example of one of the, the first patients that we treated with focused ultrasound at UCSF. We can see this image on the left, axial T2 fat saturated image, very heterogeneous appearing mass secondary to these, these fibrous septations. And on the right, we have the coronal T1 fat saturated post-contrast mass. We see this mass is homogeneously enhancement with the exception of those septations that divide up the lobules that compose the mass. And what we see is that immediately following the focused ultrasound treatment, the appearance is very dramatically different. So we can see that there's now this sort of dense, non-enhanced volume centrally within the mass, just a very thin rim of enhancement at the margins of the mass, consistent with a, a pretty dramatic treatment effect near 100% ablation in this particular instance. Uh, we know about focused ultrasounds that can also be very precise, right? So here's an example where the sciatic nerve is coursing through the mass and no surgeon could really touch this because of that. But focused ultrasound can offer selective ablation in patients like this, allowing us to improve local symptoms in a very targeted uh, but safe way. Now, the largest study for focused ultrasound treatment of desmoid tumors is a, a retrospective study, in, including 15 patients from a few years ago. And what we can see is that focused ultrasound had a very dramatic effect in terms of tumor volume decreasing 63%. Median tumor volume decrease of 105 milliliters. So really large um, volumes of, of tumor being able to uh, be taken out with just a single focus ultrasound treatment. We also know that patients have dramatically decreased pain scores following the treatment. And here's another nice example of focus ultrasound treating in a, a fairly tricky location here, the posterior aspect of the ankle. And when we think about future directions for this technology, it's really important to, to think about the limitations of treating patients um, with desmoid tumors with focused ultrasound. I think this is a really useful conversation to have because to the extent that we can solve some of these limitations, I think it's gonna open up a number of new indications for many other soft tissue tumors. So what are the, the challenges that we face? Well, first, cases are long. Um, we don't have uh, maybe the ideal intraprocedural monitoring. 
uh, strategies for preoperative planning. We really have to plan on the day of the treatment and it'd be nice to have a, a system similar to what we have with radiation therapy where uh, they do simulations prior to treating patients. Um, there's a need for more best practices when tumors are near critical structures or, or dealing with intra-abdominal lesions. Um, it's unclear what the ideal combination therapy is, so combining focused ultrasound with medical therapies. And there are issues of access as well, right? Only, I think, 10 centers worldwide where this treatment is available. So uh, in terms of uh, approaching the length of cases, we need new devices with larger sonications that can help us to be a little bit more efficient during the process. Uh, for the intraprocedural monitoring, we could use some improved thermometry strategies that allow us to have a better sense of what's happening during the treatment. Um, a fuss simulation uh, system would be great for allowing us to, before the patients even at the center on the day of the treatment, allowing us to thoroughly and com comprehensively plan the treatment. Um, again, new safety devices and new simulation strategies would be helpful for dealing with this approach to critical structures and intra-abdominal masses. Um, clinical trials are going to be essential for allowing us to figure out the ideal combinations with, with medical therapies. And we're going to have to tackle regulatory insurance issues as well as um, the issue of increasing the, the number of uh, treatment access sites. Now, some of these issues have been, been addressed um, in recent years, and we've made some steps toward understanding, for example, how we could improve thermometry. Here's an example from a couple of years ago at UCSF where we used a T2 mapping approach to predict um, pretty accurately, at least in a qualitative fashion, the non-perfused volume at the end of a treatment for a desmoid tumor. Uh, there's been other work here, some work by Shi et al. that showed how we could use focus ultrasound to treat intra-abdominal tumors despite the risk to, to bowel and other structures. So I think we, we do have some research directions that are starting to get us toward the answers that we need, but we need to, to really push this much further. So in summary, focus ultrasound is safe and effective treatment for desmoid tumors and key factors in improving treatment efficacy going forward, including include the development of new devices, improved thermometry, treatment simulations, new clinical trials, and addressing really important issues of access. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thanks so much for the invitation to speak. I'll be discussing the applications and challenges of HIFU for pediatric sarcomas. So pediatric sarcomas is a rare and heterogeneous group, but for the most part, treatment consists of intensive multimodal therapy, which in turn produces significant amount of acute and late side effects. And unfortunately, despite this intensive therapy, the prognosis remains poor for those with metastatic and recurrent pediatric sarcomas, and the outcome has virtually remained unchanged for the last 30 years. So we definitely need to improve the current therapeutic paradigm for pediatric sarcomas. MR HIFU is non-invasive, has no radiation, um, uses image guidance for precision and accuracy, has multiple bio effects, flexibility, be, flexibility to be combined with other applications and treatments, and thus far well tolerated with minimal minor reversible side effects, and thus is ideal for pediatric development. To this end, we have developed clinical trials evaluating MR HIFU ablation alone and in combination with thermosensitive liposomal doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is a chemotherapeutic agent used in many pediatric malignancies. These studies are ongoing, but thus far, all the patients enrolled have been sarcomas. And so far, MR HIFU ablation of solid tumors in children, adolescents, and young adults appears to be safe and feasible. However, there have been many challenges that have presented along the way. Patient positioning is a challenge as patients can develop sarco sarcomas essentially anywhere and we need to adjust to fit on the instrument. Tumor location and size, whether it be due to location next to a vital structure or artifact, make complete ablation not possible for the majority of the tumors we've treated, which is really needed if we want this to serve as a form of local control in pediatric sarcomas. Importantly, many lesions are not targetable due to locations in the lung, which is the most common site of metastases for sarcomas. So we need to think of ways to mitigate this. And some of the things that we're doing now is providing a drug delivery with a hypothermial application, which is soon to open in collaboration with the NIH. But I really believe the wave of the future for HIFU with sarcomas is combinatorial approaches. 
We're looking at histotripsy or ablation when combined with immunotherapy based on evidence of immune modulation through HIFU. And in our preclinical models of neuroblastoma, we see prolongation of survival through this combination, in addition to upscopal effects. We're evaluating this in a rhabdomyosarcoma preclinical model, and we hope that we will be able to translate this into a clinical trial. Thank you again. And if there are any questions or um, referrals or any other things, please uh, contact me at the information below. Hi, my name is Dr. Arik Hananel, and I'll be talking about focus ultrasound for arthritis. First, thank you to the Focus Ultrasound team for arranging those exceptional meetings. And as a disclaimer, I have shares at InsightTech and I'm the co-founder of FastMobile. As a second disclaimer, I did my best to highlight and show all published material. But if I missed anything, please let me know. I can be reached at arik at fastmobile.com. Arthritis, or more specifically osteoarthritis, is a condition where the joint itself is damaged either by trauma or by degenerative changes over time, and the damage to the joint causes local inflammation and pain. The treatment for osteoarthritis uh, has several tiers, starting with lifestyle change and physiotherapy, medication for the pain and for the inflammation, a denervation procedure where the nerves providing pain from the affected joint are destroyed, thereby alleviating the pain, or surgery where the orthopedic surgeon uh, replaces the joint with an artificial one. The role that focus ultrasound can play in this field is by uh, replacing the denervation procedure with a non-invasive thermal ablation of the nerve and non-invasive denervation. There's a variety of uh, promising indication where a uh, focus ultrasound can provide denervation starting with facet arthritis where the denervation is done on a nerve called the medial nerve branch, affecting the facet joint at the posterior aspect of the vertebra. Usually this affects the lower back, so the lumbar vertebra, or the sacroiliitis, where the, the damage to the joint is the joint between the ilium and the sacrum. Other indications are knee arthritis, hip arthritis, ankle and hand arthritis. In terms of the status of the field, I'm using a, a slide taken from the State of the Field Report by the FAST Foundation for 2020, and I marked in an asterisk the work that was already published, meaning facet arthritis, knee, and sacroiliitis. Uh, specifically for facet arthritis, uh, the treatment, the standard care today is a radiofrequency ablation under X-ray guidance, aligning the tip of the needle with the proximal end of the medial nerve branch and thermally destroying the nerve with focus ultrasound. All in all the work that was published to date, the target is actually the distal end of the medial branch nerve or targeting the joint itself, uh, thermally ablating the nerve ending that enter into the joint. As you can see in this MRI image taken from Evan et al, uh, whose work was done at uh, St. Mary with Dr. Gedroik. Uh, a lot of other uh, work was done uh, uh, evaluating the effectiveness of focus ultrasound for facet arthritis. I think uh, out of this work, I just want to note a series of 40 cases reported by Dr. Dukes from Frankfurt, which has the most um, aggressive uh, therapy regimen, going up to 2,500 joules and four to eight sonication per joint. But uh, he reported uh, the best results so far with 80% of the patient having a significant reduction in their pain at six months. Those results are uh, not only best in focus ultrasound, but are superior even to our population. Uh, all those work was done using the InsightTech Exablate uh, platform. As I said, the target was always the distal branches. And from the preclinical aspect, there was the work from Memorial Sloan Catering evaluating the proximal uh, branch uh, approach where uh, targeting uh, in a similar manner in the same location as RF ablation. The UCSF team who looked at MRI appearance of the joint before and after ablation and the team from Shiba who did the first preclinical work 
which allowed uh, for the clinical submission or for the clinical studies. Uh, knee arthritis was done by the team at Kochi University in Japan. Uh, two publications, a series of eight and 19 uh, patients, uh, both reporting a good outcome at three and six months of 67 and 70, 72%. Uh, this work was done with the portable bone system from InsightTech, targeting, again, the nerve ending going into the joint itself, as you can see from the image on the left. For sacroiliitis, most of the work has been preclinical uh, by the team at Memorial Sloan Catering and UCSF. Uh, both teams were targeting the posterior aspect of the sacrum, uh, either medial to the sacroiliac joint or doing semicircle around the sacral foramina in the back and both prove ablation uh, in imaging and histology. And there's even a clinical uh, report, one case study done by University of Zurich using the Sonali platform, where they target lateral to the sacral foramina doing eight cells of four millimeter each, and they achieved a pain-free result at six months following procedure. Since I am running out of time, as a summary for interventional pain clinician, focus ultrasound has the potential to be a superior alternative to existing standard of care. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Joanne Tui. I'm a veterinary surgical oncologist at the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. And I'm here today to speak with you about some veterinary applications of focused ultrasound techniques uh, that we're evaluating at Virginia Tech and using our pet patients as a comparative oncology model. So the oncology service at Virginia Tech has recently opened its doors as the Animal Cancer Care and Research Center in Roanoke, Virginia. And one of the main goals of this center is to promote comparative oncology research, which in turn then progresses the idea of One Health. So the concept of One Health is not a new one. So comparative oncology is very grounded in this concept, which is the idea that the health of people is intrinsically linked to animal health and environmental health. And this core idea of One Health is not new, it is quite old and has been present in many of our principles of modern medicine. As a subspecialty of the One Health concept that focuses specifically on cancer, comparative oncology bridges the both human and veterinary medical worlds such that we can study cancer across species to understand the causes and consequences of cancer, and also to identify and evaluate new therapies and treatments. So comparative oncology has historically turned to pet dogs with naturally occurring cancers as unique models that really closely resemble human cancer. So the old adage that dogs look just like their people they ring, that rings true in not just their looks, as you can see from the pictures here, but also in many other ways. So for example, osteosarcoma, which is the most pro common primary bone cancer in the dog and in adolescent um, children and, um, and teenagers, this tumor is very similar in both dogs and humans. Osteosarcoma has matching biological behavior in both species. It is highly metastatic, um, especially to the lungs. And osteosarcoma shares very similar histological characteristics. When we look at the tumor on a slide under a microscope, the tumors from both species look almost identical. Osteosarcoma shares gene expression, expression signatures between species and the advantages of using the dog as a comparative oncology model are numerous, especially in tumors such as osteosarcoma, which, are, which is very similar between dogs and people. So using dogs has the advantage of dogs being an outbred species, so they share the same environment as people. And also, 
dogs with their increased size, so their larger size compared to rat laboratory rodents, they are a model that is very easy to study certain treatment modalities because of their size, such that those treatment modalities used to evaluate um, treatments in dogs will more closely mirror those that could be used in people. And also, the increased incidence of osteosarcoma and many other cancers in dogs offers a spontaneously occurring tumor model for a lot of these cancers. Also in dogs, unfortunately, with their shorter life expectancy as compared to humans, we can also study the disease and the outcomes of treatments in a more compressed time frame. So I'd like to share with you very briefly the two studies that are ongoing at the Virginia Maryland College of Vet Med with the Oncology Service to demonstrate the principle of using these dogs to not only study treatment options for dogs, but also with the long-term goal of advancing these options for human use. So one of our studies is evaluating high-intensity focused ultrasound, HIFU, as a thermal ablation technique for soft tissue sarcomas. And thus far, the dogs that we have enrolled in this study have not, have not exhibited any side effects except for one dog that exhibited some thermal damage in the surrounding tissue that was outside of the treatment zone. With this study, as well as the subsequent study that I'll, I'll show you, these dogs do undergo resection of their tumor as part of standard of care therapy after their high food treatment. Thus, the thermal damage fortunately did not have any adverse effects on the patient in the long term. And as for our histotripsy study, we have a study for using histotripsy to treat osteosarcoma in dogs with the intention of advancing this therapy if we have positive results um, to potentially evaluating the technique in people as well. But that is a long-term goal. So our immediate goal is to evaluate the use of histotripsy to treat these bone tumors in dogs. And as you can see thus far, we have a setup for histotripsy treatment and the bubble cloud that is uh, exhibited on the in, in the image on the right. I'd like to show you the histology of one of our patients that we have treated with histotripsy. And as you can see on the left side of the slide, you see intact tumor cells in that light pink area, and that is the untreated zone of the tumor. On the right side in the darker area, the darker red and pink area, that is the treated area and there are no intact tumor cells in there. It is a field of necrosis, and there is a very clear interface that separates the treated versus untreated area of the tumor. So thus far, the results from our studies on histotripsy, using histotripsy as well as HIFU, have been very encouraging, and we're hopeful that we can use these results to contribute and advance our long-term goal of advancing comparative oncology research such that we benefit cancer treatment for both humans and for dogs. And I look forward to our upcoming discussion. Hello everyone, my name is Pejman Ganuni and I'm gonna be moderating our musculoskeletal applications panel. I wanna thank our uh, panelists for their excellent uh, talks covering important applications in soft tissue tumors, uh, facet joint arthritis and veterinary applications. We have a lot of questions already coming in and uh, so let's, let's get to it. Uh, first for Dr. Buckner, you showed some applications where you were treating around critical structures such as nerves. What is, what's your approach when you're planning and treating? What are you doing to take care around these structures as you, as you ablate? Um, that's a great question. And thanks, um, thanks to the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, when I'm treating around nerves, my first step is really first and foremost, make sure that you're getting great visualization. So um, taking care with the pre-planning sequences, either 
a T1, or sometimes we use a LAVA and FSPGR type sequence just to make sure we can really clearly see the nerves. And then I tend to, um, within the, the software platform, mark off the nerves with a fiducial so I can keep track of that carefully um, and make sure that all sonications are at least a seven, full centimeter away. Now, if it's a really big desmoid tumor and I think there are going to be a lot of sonications, I might inch that up closer to 15 millimeters, knowing that there's going to be some residual heating that occurs and my thermometry might be giving me slightly less than perfect um, data with regard to what's actually getting hot. Um, and then I fairly painstakingly look at the aggregate beam path to see how much energy might be passing through the nerve in the far field and trying to reduce that. So, you know, overall, it, it takes a lot of time and it's imperfect. So I think there's definitely a need for for better solutions, ideally something, some kind of automated approach to um, defining that boundary with critical nerve structures. Dr. Buckner, do you ever treat uh, tumors that encase the nerve or is it mostly tumors next to the nerve? that you're talking about? Yeah, I think probably most often it's next to adjacent to the nerve, but I, I have treated a few where it's encased the nerve. And so obviously sur surgery wasn't possible in those cases. And I think it's very difficult to perform a, a total ablation of any kind for those sorts of patients. But I think focus ultrasound is unique in that it can debulk that tumor without any other side effects. So you can add a one tumor in the posterior aspect of the thigh that in case the sciatic nerve. And what we did was just, just tried to debulk the, the posterior aspect of that tumor mm -hmm. and decrease the patient's pain and improve their range of motion. Um, so that patient ended up coming in maybe every once every year to once every 18 months. And every time they would have an improvement in their pain and their, their range of motion for quite a few months afterwards. And that patient actually, she kept doing that over and over because she, she thought it was a really great option. But unfortunately, she eventually had a, a coverage lapse and then wasn't able to have any further treatment. So I, I do think in general, though, that concept of focus ultrasound for desmoid tumors almost as, as managing a sort of chronic disease is something that is feasible. That's a nice segue. Another question from the audience. Uh, you had reported uh, a median volume reduction in desmoid tumors after ablation of about 63%. Uh, the audience asks, uh, I wonder how long was uh, your follow-up time was for this result? At what, what, what time point was this uh, reported? I think the 63% the comes from the, the retrospective study that um, uh, had a bunch of collaborators, yourself, me, and uh, a few others um, across the world. And I, I believe that that was immediately um, post, uh, post procedure, if I recall correctly. Um, I, I'd say that in general, the percentage of, of ablation varies quite a bit from treatment to treatment. And in my case, I think it depends a little bit on the goals of the treatment. It depends on whether or not there's something critical that blocks full access to the tumor. And so, um, I think it's important to, to take the percentages that you get at the end of a treatment with a grain of salt and considering them in the context of what were the, the goals for the treatment. Yeah, I think your answers also are, are uh, follow up to what you said, that it, it would be great to have simulation ahead of time so that you could account for these nerves and other critical structures in the initial planning process rather than having to do it one by one on the fly. And I think also when you were talking about treating large tumors, uh, that having a, a, a technology that's capable of really varying the size of the ablation spot uh, more, more so than we're capable of doing now, where, you know, in safer areas, we could get a larger ablation done quickly. And then as we get closer to these critical structures, then really hone in and, and do smaller sonications, smaller ablations. So ho hopefully uh, we, we see some of these improvements. Uh, it's a nice uh, segue to some questions for Dr. Kim as well. And then actually, Matt, I'll have a question when we come back a little bit later, because you talked a little bit about ac access. This kind of ties into Dr. Kim's uh, stuff too. Uh, Dr. Kim, you were talking about the challenges with positioning uh, and the time spent on trying to make sure that we can access the tumor. You know, with desmoid tumors, obviously we have, uh, I don't know if it's a luxury or not, but because it's not a, a malignancy, we can treat part of the tumor. And we've seen that with partial ablations, we see symptomatic improvement, um, if, if temporary, but perhaps uh, better tolerated than uh, some of the medications anyway. To come, As Dr. Buckner was saying, a patient can come back every six to 12 months and get another HIFU rather than constantly being on medications with their attendant side effects. Uh, 
Uh, in, in your setting, you, you were saying that obviously with sarcomas, we need complete ablations. And so that uh, plus the location of some of these tumors obviously limits access. Um, do you have a, an, an opinion about what the ideal device would look like to allow better access uh, in terms of treatment for the, for the patients that you've been seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of it is positioning, which makes it difficult. And then there's other things that you've already been talked about, like po where it's located in terms of close to nerve and whether you're really able to feasibly or too close to skin. So many of those limitations are present regardless of the positioning of where the tumor is. But we've also, and I'm sure you've experienced, um, we're limited by what the instrument is and where the um, where the, the ultrasound transducer is located on the instrument. So we have to sometimes position the patient if their tumor is like located up on like the lower part of the leg, we have to position them far away from the table and or sometimes, you know, put them in kind of configure positions. And so, you know, if there was a in an ideal setting, if that could be more flexible, if we can wrap like some of the neural modulars, you can wrap things around. I think those would make things easier, but um, you know, position aside, I think most of the limitations we find in terms of whether or not we can completely ablate or not completely ablate is more in terms of next to being uh, next to vital structures, nerves, vessels that really make complete ablation for um, not feasible. Even if we can get near complete ablation, that's not sufficient for something like a malignant sarcoma, you know, as a local control method alone. I, that, that's where I really believe that the adjuvant therapy is really needed in order to be able to um, get at the entire tumor. Other than the imaging, are there additional markers you're looking for to see whether or not, uh, you know, your combination therapies are working? Are you, are, in, in these trials that you proposed where you're, you are looking at combination therapy, whether with hyperthermia or uh, ablation plus drug, et cetera. Uh, wh what are you looking at to, to see whether the combination is, is advantageous? Yeah, so for our primary outcome, you know, we're using traditional measurements that we do in many of our cancer therapies, which is RESIST, which we find is not very good mm -hmm. actually for um, ablation and other approaches. That being said, we know that um, malignant cancers grow and they grow, especially in the pediatric sarcomas, they grow relatively rapidly. So we see, can see changes if it's not working and there's progression at the next stage, we know that there's there's growth. We are looking at MR volumetrics um, in terms of perfusion areas, which I think is a good marker. Um, and then we're actually looking at, you know, patients present, um, for some of our patients that present with multiple sites of lesions, we're looking at the other sites as well. Um, you know, again, it's a very, very small number and we haven't seen that, you know, magical uh, scopal type effect, but we're only, we haven't looked at imu combined immunotherapy yet either in the clinical setting and only in preclinical models. So right now, you know, we're, you know, looking at outcomes in the traditional sense, but I think there are better ways that we need to think about what our outcome measurements should be. And that's something that we need to think about when we think about clinical trial design for um, HIFU plus alone or with combination therapies. Yeah, I, I think your point about uh, resist is is key. You know, we we've done studies here looking um, at drugs and their effects on uh, desmoids, and we've just found that uh, there's considerable heterogeneity in just applying diameters uh, mm -hmm. to these very infiltrative tumors, and especially with desmoids where it's a partial ablation. You know, keeping track of the dead volume versus the still viable volume seems yeah. to be critical in assessing. It's very tedious, obviously, but I yeah. think it's critical. Just to be clear, for your for these trials, are you only admitting patients that that, to, that you think you can completely ablate the tumor? No, um, we are. Um, so you know, no, we're not, and um, we're you know what's that we can at least target, um, but we don't need to have complete ablation, especially the ones with thermodox. As our hope is that we can use the um, the drug for periablative um, zone. Got it. Got it. And you, you talked about ablation versus histotripsy. Are you doing any direct comparisons between these two techniques in, in, in rather preclinical or do you plan clinical trials to yeah. compare? So we don't have it in clinic. We don't have histotripsy, obviously, in clinical setting. In our preclinical model system right now, we are comparing um, histotripsy um, and ablation because um, in the neuroblastoma model that has already been set, but now with the rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma model that we're working on now, and primarily for that was because we would had hoped if we see similar findings that we have with the histotripsy model that we would be able to bring it to cl the clinical setting quicker. Um, mm -hmm. But that work is currently being done right now. I see. I see. 
That's right. That, that's actually a, a nice uh, uh, segue uh, to Dr. Tui's work as well. Dr. Tui, you had talked about uh, in comparison of HIFU and histotripsy as well in some of the veterinary applications. Have you seen an advantage of one or the, versus the other? Are you doing any comparative work, whether uh, histologically or biochemically or by imaging to, to look at these two approaches? Yeah, thank you. So um, we have had uh, some studies using HIFU, evaluating HIFU for treatment of, in general, soft tissue sarcomas in dogs. And um, we just started a trial with um, histotripsy, uh, evaluating the effects of histotripsy um, on soft tissue sarcomas in dogs with the intention of comparing the two. And it is uh, too early right now. Unfortunately, I do not have any substantial results um, to report, but the, the intention is to compare um, between modalities. And to me, um, I am uh, very excited with the potential of histotripsy as a non-thermal um, method of ablation. Mm -hmm. And so it is something that I would like to explore further, especially uh, with uh, certain tumors such as osteosarcoma. And all of your approaches thus far, if I'm correct, have been uh, treat and resect. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So and we do not aim to treat the entire area of the tumor. Mm -hmm. um, we're treating a prescribed volume um, so that we have comparison between treated areas and untreated areas of the tumor. Have you found a good overlap then between what the, the imaging prediction and uh, the planned treatment area and what you're seeing histologically? Yes, so for our soft tissue sarcoma patients, yes, there is good correlation uh, between what we're seeing uh, grossly as well as on imaging, and we are using CT imaging um, mm -hmm. as the imaging modality, and also histologically. Um, interestingly, in our osteosarcoma study, we are not seeing quite yet, and again, this is all very early, we're not quite seeing that correlation between treatment um, that appears, the treatment zone that appears grossly, um, and CT imaging. Um, histologically, we see that correlation, but um, we seem to be having some limitations with uh, our CT. And so a potential avenue of investigation is to, um, is to evaluate the utility of MR imaging in these particular uh, cases of osteosarcoma. Some years ago, we did a study, a treat and resect in uh, sarcomas uh, in, in humans. Um, and again, uh, similar to what has been described by the panelists here, uh, it was an uh, approach where we treated a portion of the tumor and then they went on to resection. Um, what we found is that when we were treating close to bone, we actually got um, a much larger uh, ablation zone uh, than what we'd originally targeted. Um, as we all understand, there's heating on the bone itself and a radiative effect, and sometimes you get a bonus. Uh, obviously, you have to be careful uh, about where that bonus area spreads to, but uh, we, we definitely have seen some heterogeneity the closer you get to the bone. Uh, in terms of um, some of the limitations, uh, you know, I imagine you want to at some point potentially go to something where you are treating completely rather than treat and resect, maybe as a subsequent phase. Uh, I imagine heating on the skin is a significant issue uh, uh, for the, some of these for the, some of these treatments. Are you using an active cooling system right now to to protect the skin during the treatment? So, uh, if so, with regards to the um, HIFU um, ablations, uh, no, we are not using an active um, cooling system currently because our targeted areas of treatments are well away. We make sure they're well away from the skin. But yes, you're absolutely right. Once we progress to the intent to treat the entire tumor, mm -hmm. uh, we would have to start exploring ways to, to reduce that um, risk of uh, thermal injury to the skin. And, and in, high, in HIFU, as well as potentially even with histotripsy, um, depending on the, how superficial that tumor may be and its proximity to the skin uh, with the soft tissue sarcoma, um, with our osteosarcoma patients, um, we it, depending again on the area of the tumor, I am not as concerned with some of these tumors that are deeper, obviously, but certainly some of these tumors are more superficial. Mm -hmm. 
we can talk later, but uh, the Fuss Foundation recently sponsored a uh, project by Allison Payne at the University of Utah uh, to design an aftermarket uh, uh, skin cooling device. Oh, wow. Uh, that we can use in humans and also in potentially in veterinary applications. Oh, that's wonderful. Arik, this, uh, this talk of, um, of uh, thermometry and proximity to the skin and so forth is a nice segue as well. How important is thermometry for fuss treatment of facet joint arthritis? Or is that a key component of the, of the work you're doing or not? So the, the best uh, definite answer I can say is yes and no. <laughs> it's, important, it's important to have uh, some way of closing the loop during the development of the procedure. It could be MR thermometry, it could be, thermo, could be thermocouple imaging, uh, pathology, but during the development of, uh, of any clinical indication, and obviously a facet joint ablation, uh, having a closed loop uh, modality allows to optimize, the treatment protocol allows to optimize the predictor, the planner. However, once those things are optimized, there's two ways to go. There's the radiosurgery path, which is uh, you plan, you rely on the prediction and deploy the procedure. And there's, you know, the return fibroid, MRG fast path, where there is a need for a closed loop thermal feedback. The closed loop thermal feedback is great, but it comes with a certain uh, baggage. It's, impo it's, it's expensive. It can complicate uh, the procedure logistically, and it may extend the procedure time. Having the ability to predict the procedure outcome can compensate for all of this, specifically for low back pain, uh, where the cost of the procedure and, and the amount of, of um, uh, infrastructure involved are definitely away from our standard MRG FAS. Mm -hmm. So once it's possible to optimize the procedure, getting a closed loop thermal feedback and having a reliable predictor, I would say at this point, thermometry is not a must. Uh, I, I would even add that due to the nature of uh, most of the MSK targets being soft tissue on the bone tissue interface and the acoustic properties of the bone, it is possible to rely on predictor in many cases. The bone is very predictable, is very absorptive. You don't necessarily need a closed loop thermal anytime. Very good, and I appreciate the the fact that you have to take the, uh, the the kind of business comparative aspects into account when you're thinking about kind of what you'd like to have and what you must have, you know. What and that's a very good feedback. One last question, um, as as our time winds down, in your experience, how long is a denervation after this approach for treatment of facet joint arthritis? How long does that pain relief last? I. There isn't enough data, not, not in what the studies that we're doing, not in the studies that were published. So far, it seems it's equivalent to RF ablation, where the standard of care are kind of around six months. But using HIFU approach provide at least a potential benefit where the lesion is bigger, taking out a bigger chunk of the nerve, maybe improving durability. Very good. Very good. And have you treated any patients with, that are post-surgical? A, we've treated a patient after a, a cement injection, and uh, at least in our case, the cement was not in the beam pathway, and it didn't do any problem. As long as the, there's no scars or no metal implant, it should be viable. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, for participating in this panel. Uh, I learned uh, something from each of you. I appreciate the collegiality and sharing of information and insights. Thank you very much for participating in the musculoskeletal applications panel. Look